I'm Janet Connor, prayer artist and mystic witch, and the Return of the Witches Jeanne d'Arc Listening Pilgrimage opens on Friday, June 4th, with an opening ceremony conducted by Sabin Bailey. I thought you might like to hear a little something about the 13 witches and women that are on this pilgrimage. We begin on Mount Carmel in Israel, Palestine, that land has had so many names, with Queen Jezebel, whose name is now, has become the worst thing you could possibly call a woman. And guess what? Her name means nothing like that. She's the last polytheist queen of Israel. We then go to Mary Magdalene, whose story starts in the same place in Palestine, but then continues to Alexandria, Egypt, and where we know her in France. Her story is extraordinary, and Mary Magdalene is not who you think she is, the story told in the Bible. We then meet one of her contemporaries, Queen Boudicca on Britain, at the same time that Rome was decimating the Jewish population in Palestine, it was decimating the Celtic tribal indigenous population on the island of Britain. Queen Boudicca gathered all of these tribes that had been at one another's throats and got them to turn their attention. And she came pretty close to driving Rome off her island. She's a Welsh queen. If you are seeking a little strength, a little courage to fight, Boudicca is your girl. We then go to France and meet a Cathar woman, Dame Giraud de Lavar. I'm practicing. I'm not there yet. The Cathars, you might know, are the victims of the only crusade on European soil, soil and it's against Christians, led by ordered by a pope. <clears throat> he ordered crusades against Muslims in the Middle East, and then he ordered that every single man, woman, and child who was a Cathar be murdered. We go to France and Marguerite Poirot. Marguerite Poirot was born in Belgium. She's a Beguine. A Beguine means an independent spiritual woman, nominally Christian, but what matters is not in a nunnery, not under the auspices of the church, not married. Women that lived on their own, made a living on their own. This is the 1300s. She wrote a book, a book for lay people in the vernacular about how to have a mystical life. She was imprisoned for a year and a half, refusing to take the oath of the Inquisition. If you know my son's story at all, you know why I love Marguerite Poirette. My son was a political prisoner for almost a year of his life because he refused to speak. I love Marguerite Poirette. Now we're gonna to go to Germany. Germany has the highest volume of men, women, and children murdered as witches. The height of the witch craze is in Germany. We are going to meet a particular family murdered in Germany, the von Menzenkamps. Two generations of mothers and daughters murdered and the sons forced to watch. If you want to know why the trauma of what was done to witches traveled all the way to the Americas to do horrific harm, it happened in Germany. Then we're going to go to Scotland. The two countries that have the highest density of horror and pain in the witch craze are Germany and Scotland. In Germany, because it's the highest volume. In Scotland, because it's the highest percentage of the population. The very first woman murdered as a witch is Janet Boyman. That got my attention. 1572, but then in 1727, that many years later, the last witch burned in Scotland is 
Janet Horn. Their book ends. How many women and children were murdered in the bookends of these two Janets? 4,000 were accused, almost every one of them tortured. And no one knows exactly how many were murdered, but it might be as high as 2,500. As the witch craze was ending in Europe, it got on a ship and came with the Protestants to America. And most people know about Rebecca Nurse. She is championed by her ninth grade granddaughter, Paula Springer. Rebecca Nurse was a leader of her church, which proves that even if you were in the community of your church, you could still be murdered as a witch. She was hung in 19, 1692 and her daughters, bless them, collected her body. And it's a famous tombstone now in Danvers, Massachusetts. But imprisoned along with her was a young Arawak woman from teenager from the Caribbean, Tituba. Tituba was not hung. She was sold away and no one knows exactly what happened to to Tuba. And it's interesting that the white people in prison, we do know their stories, we do know their names, but a black enslaved woman, teenager, no. There are no records. And now we come to the great horror of the witch craze, the witch time, the witch burnings in Europe, is it sweeps into the United States the largest Holocaust of all time happened right here, up and down all the Americas, but we'll focus on the United States where 18 million indigenous peoples were here. This is their land. They took care of it. It fed them. They had a very earth-centric, devoted spiritual practice within a very short period of the arrival of the Europeans, there were 3 million. Anarka. Anarka is the dearest to me in this pilgrimage. We only know her name. She was a slave girl, 17 years old. We only know her name because the father of gynecology proudly described in his documents how he tortured her. 30 vaginal surgeries without anesthesia. And for this, he is seen as the father of gynecology. If there's one woman in this intense, in this pilgrimage that we want to surround, wrap our arms around her and hold her close and dear, it is Anarka. The horror continues after slavery is legally ended and it shows up in lynching. I knew I had to have a woman that was lynched. Her name is Mary Turner. It is the worst of the worst of the worst. In 1918 in Valdosta, Georgia, where there is now a historical marker. She was eight months pregnant. She was eight months pregnant. And then the horror of what was done to black people in the United States of America sweeps right back across the ocean in Nazi Germany. You know why? Because the Nazis studied, studied, and they kept records being good Nazis. So we know they studied what was done to black people in the United States of America. And they actually, after days of discussion, decided that they would take what we did but not all of it. They wouldn't be as bad as the United States of America. And the woman that holds this heart is Eddie Hillisum. She was 29 years old when she was murdered in Auschwitz, but she's a young author, a journal keeper in Holland. And finally, the pilgrimage comes to an end with a most extraordinary woman 
Her name is Dejama Labupacha, and she was a fighter against France for independence for Algeria. This is so interesting because our leader, Jeanne d'Arc, fought for freedom for France. And now we end with a woman who fought for freedom from France. In 1960, she was sentenced to death and imprisoned and tortured and raped, a devout Muslim woman. But she didn't stay silent. Somehow, she got word out, she told people, the word traveled back to France, and authors and actresses and playwrights and movie directors and artists and even Picasso got wind of it and began to speak. And because of everyone speaking, everyone talking about what was done to her body in prison, French law was changed. The French army was no longer allowed, it was legal before Dejamala, to rape and torture their prisoners. These are our 13. We begin with Joan of Arc and we end with Dejamala, who, are you surprised to hear, saw herself as Joan of Arc. These are the 13. We will travel to each one of their locations. We will get to meet them in their land, in their prayers. How did they pray? What did they eat? What did they wear? We will hear their stories and we will bear witness. We will bear witness with what was done to them. And as we bear witness to what to them, we will find that that trauma has come through time and is in our bodies and we will look at that and heal it. But the greatest and most important, the purpose of this pilgrimage is as we meet each one of these 13 women to ask them, what remains of you? Not just your trauma, which I know we carry in our bodies, but what remains of your strength, your goodness, your medicine? What in your story can we take and embody and bring to life so that we can create a garden of reverence where all women, all witches, all children, everyone is safe and heard and seen. This is the purpose of the Return of the Witches Jeanne d'Arc listening pilgrimage. We're listening for what these women want us to know, want to remember, and want to create. Join us. We open on Friday, June 4th, and then meet Queen Jezebel on Saturday and every consecutive Saturday for 13 weeks. Who will we be when we have completed this pilgrimage? I don't know, but I know we will be carrying their sacred medicine. We will be transformed and transformed people can transform the world.